Hello and welcome. My name is Tenley Proudfoot and I am the Digital Production Assistant with Dataversity, stepping in for our Shannon Kemp, our Chief Digital Manager. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Quality Strategies, the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in, particip in partnership with Data Blueprint. Just a couple of notes to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom center of your screen to select that feature. We will be collecting questions throughout the duration of the webinar, and that can be located using the three dots in the middle of the bottom middle of your screen or via Twitter using hashtag data ed. To answer the most commonly asked question, as always, we will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing the links to the slides and the recording as well as um, the recordings of this session at, along with any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce you to our speaker for today. Uh, who is Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles as well as 11 books. The most recent is Your Data Strategy. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the US Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. So hello and welcome. The uh, Data Architecture Summit in uh, Chicago, where the rest of your team is as well. And uh, we're having a great time downstairs. I had to duck out of that to do this, but we're going to talk specifically today about data quality, which is not on the program for the Data, quality, uh, data Architecture Summit, but nevertheless is a, an important topic. So today what we're going to look at is data quality in the context of our data management profession. I'll look at a specific definition for data quality, and I like to add the word engineering to the end of it, because most people really don't understand that it is an engineering discipline and must be applied as an engineering discipline as opposed to strictly an attempt to clean up data. <clears throat> we'll talk specifically then about the data quality engineering cycle and a couple of contextual complications around the whole process. Look at data quality causes and data quality dimensions, which are not really widely understood. And then we'll look at quality in the data quality life cycle, finishing up about an hour from now with some toolkits. Then we'll get, of course, to the questions and answer period, which is really where we have a lot of fun on this. The idea is that you'll have a better idea as you're getting started on data quality journey of what actually needs to happen. And, and just to short circuit some of that discussion, one of the most important takeaways from this is that, yes, we need some tools to do this, but tools are not the place to start. It's really more of a people and process problem than it is a tool problem. Now, I start this particular uh, session by saying that my uh, spouse is a horse person, and I'm what's called a horse husband. And what that means is that she has a big T-shirt that says, I love my husband, and then in fine print it says at the bottom almost as much as I love my horse. And you may be saying, well, why are we talking about this? Well, it turns out that part of the deal is we're going to build a barn together because we're both horse lovers uh, on this. And the overall approach to building a barn is interesting when you look at it compared to how we do large, complex IT systems. Uh, I took these pictures of the barn to prove one thing in particular. 
and that was that we had passed a foundation inspection. Now, the bank, in loaning me the money to build the barn, actually gave me enough money to build the foundation, not the entire barn. And that's an interesting approach because the bank understands that without a good quality foundation, I may build a good barn on top of a poor quality foundation. And if I do that, I will spend more in vet bills for my horses than I will paying the bank its loan back. And my point in illustrating this is that there is no IT equivalent in our context here because most people don't really understand that data management is an awful lot like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We can start out with our food, clothing, and shelter needs being unmet. If they are unmet, then we can never be safe. If we have food, clothing, and shelter needs that are met, it doesn't mean that we will be safe, but it means we can't be safe if those needs are unmet. Same thing with safety is a necessary but insufficient prerequisite to being part of something that is larger than ourselves. Uh, the concept of love and belonging, family, and things like this. <clears throat> and if you're not part of something bigger than yourself, of course, you really have trouble getting to know yourself. So you have your own identity as part of this larger piece. Moving on up the chain, each of these levels, orange, yellow, green, and then blue, are necessary but insufficient prerequisites to where we'd like to be, which is self-actualization. And I, I say that and spend a minute on it because data is an awful lot like that. There's a huge technology focus where people are trying to sell your organization all kinds of really good products that work very, very well. But that buying those products really is just the tip of the data, uh, the data iceberg. And in this case, it requires foundational practices, one of which, of course, is data quality. These are capabilities. They are not technologies. They are people and process-related um, issues. And consequently, it's very difficult to get people to not buy the stuff at the top because that's what's being advertised, but instead concentrate on the things down underneath, which are part of a discipline called engineering and architecture that is absolutely missing from most college university curriculum out around this. Now, the idea is that if we do these foundational practices better, just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these are necessary but insufficient prerequisites for success. But of course, you can see that just starting with just the tools at the top is not going to lead to success ever. And we're always asked at Data Blueprint, can you do this faster for us? And the answer is yes, we can work faster, but if we do that, it will take longer, cost more, deliver less, and present greater risk to the organization than instead if you learn to crawl, walk, and run your way up to the top of that pyramid. These are the same five data quality practice areas that I had on the previous slide. And they have some definitions now. We're actually in pretty good shape. We can say that it is important to manage your data cohesively. Right now, your data is probably managed very well at the work group level. That is one of the defining characteristics of a work group. You can access a set of talent or people who uh, know how to manage these assets professionally. We have data governance professionals that we've picked out over the years. Quality, of course, is, is the idea of maintaining the data that is fit for purpose and doing it in an effective and efficient manner. Then, of course, we have the platform and the architecture, which says you're doing it with the right tools and the right processes. Of course, you need some supporting processes around this. And this is a part that most people are unaware of, but it is foundational to this type of discipline. There's a scale that we have out there that says you have one point for having a pulse, two points for having a repeatable process, three points for having a process that is documented, four points for measurements that occur within the process, and five points if you get together and look at those measurements and decide what should be reorganized in order to more fully optimize for your particular organization. This is the CMMI scale. Many are familiar with it. Uh, in fact, even if you're not familiar with it, I'm pretty sure your boss is familiar with it. The idea is that the uh, capability maturity model has the best track record of providing process improvement around this. And of course, we're applying it to data here. So if you just say this is CMM for data, your boss will understand it. And I'm going to give you an example on this right now where I'm going to rate each of these four areas, data strategy, data governance, uh, data platform, data architecture, at a level three. It's just that it says we're, we're doing repeatable work with documentation around it, but that the data quality area is a weak link in that chain. What it means is that the entire foundation of these practices can only be as strong as the weakest link, and that they may put more money into data governance, which would be a reasonable thing to do, except that it won't produce any better results until they take the data quality piece and bring it up to the same level as the others are at. So unless you have threes all the way around, 
it's impossible to get a higher rating and, more importantly, a higher performance. Just the same as I go back to the foundation of my barn that I showed you a minute ago. And if I had put the barn foundation as, uh, you know, cracked seashells and things like that, it would not be nearly as strong, as durable, and it would certainly not pass the county inspection, and therefore the bank would never give me the rest of the money in order to do this. When we look at data management in here, the Dimbach Guide to the Body of Knowledge gives us a, a good idea of what happens here. This is a good description of it. It is actually good enough to criticize, and that's perfectly reasonable. We're looking for improvement. It reminds me of George Fox's quote that, some models, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. We think this is a useful one, but it's missing two important concepts, optionality and dependencies in here. We just don't show them, which means people look at this wheel and say, oh, I must do data warehousing in order to do this. No, what it actually says is that data warehousing is a part of what can be done. Now, we've upgraded the model. We're now at the Dimbach version two. You can still see, however, the data quality is right there at 11 o'clock where we need it to be, starting with governance and then looking in at quality, these are two areas that would be important to take a look at. So let's take a look from the DIMLOC 1 at an IPO diagram. IPO stands for Inputs, Process, and Outputs. These are very nice articulations. We found them useful over the years uh, to talk specifically about this. I'm not going to read you every line on this chart, but this essentially is the map for what we're going to cover today. There are some specific inputs. There's some activities around this, and it requires some systems thinking in order to do this properly. And then the outputs, of course, have to be accounted for so that we can properly <clears throat> ensure that we're getting the right focus within our efforts on all of this. Let's take a look specifically data quality and data governance in context. We have a strategy. We have data governance. And strategy, of course, is what the data assets do to support the strategy. And they should be expressed in business goals. And data governance is how well is that strategy working. The data governance language should be metadata in order to do that. And when we look at quality, then, governance says that some aspects of data could benefit from improvement. I'm willing to bet that's probably true for all of your organizations that are listening on this. And that the good quality function is going to provide evolutionary feedback about the current focus. Are we hitting the business objectives that we're looking for? So we ought to see data quality efforts led out of the data governance organization, although they can arise from the business. But we'd like data governance to actually be part of the process of continuing to clean those up. So that's our contextual piece on all of this. Now, let's get to a definition here. I'm going to give you a specific model. Uh, some of you may have heard this before, but I asked people, what does the number 42 mean? The answer is 42 is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. <clears throat> now, that sounds insane until you realize that probably many people on this call here, and, and when I speak worldwide, there's always at least one person in the crowd who has read the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The turns out, the plot of that book is that the white mice and the dolphins actually running the world with us as the experiment. <clears throat> and uh, they'd like to find out uh, what the meaning of life is. So they set up a gigantic supercomputer. It runs for 300 centuries, comes back at the end of 300 centuries, and says the meaning of life, the universe, and everything is 42. Now, the rest of you are going, I'm sorry, I don't understand what's going on here. I thought we were talking about data quality. Well, let's, let's talk about what data means. Data is a combination of a fact and a meaning. And if you learn nothing else from this webinar today, you've learned that the meaning of life is 42. It also will tell you, if you dig deep enough, you'll find out that 42 is the, um, uh, was my age 17 years ago. Well, OK, again, so what? These are facts and meanings, and that's useful stuff. We need to manage it. But we need to go a little bit further than that in order to get information. We need to find out information is data that is provided in response to a request from the user. The user may ask, is Peter old enough to buy adult beverages? If you answer the question, well, 42, uh, 17 years ago, his age was 42, and they're probably at least going to be able to figure out that I'm allowed to buy adult beverages. That information is useful, but to really get at good information, you need to find out how information is used at the strategic level. And that really requires one additional layer of complexity on all this. When we take the information that has been requested, and then we see how it's being used strategically by the business, this is important. Now, you'll notice that if there is a mismatch of a fact and a meaning, therefore no information and therefore no intelligence can occur. Again, just as we were talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, data foundation is insufficient but necessary prerequisite to information foundation, which is in also insufficient but uh, necessary as a condition to get to intelligent use of data in your business. 
So from a data quality perspective, we've agreed for a long time, Martin Epler came up with a very good saying that data is fit for purpose. That's highly subjective and it should be. Yes, we'd love to employ data, have, not have all perfect data for everywhere in the world, and it's just not going to happen. It's entirely too much work to do this. So one of the really interesting stories about all of this is that the um, uh, U.S. Department of um, Labor Statistics and the FDA did some work early on where they were rating the vegetable content of various vegetables, excuse me, the uh, vitamin content of various vegetables. And somebody interestingly turned out to make a data error in their calculations there, and spinach looked like it had magical properties to it. It was actually a um, decimal point that had been transposed incorrectly. And so it made spinach look like it was two orders of magnitude more potent as a vegetable than others, which is literally where the Popeye uh, genre came from. Popeye has his can of spinach, and don't get me wrong, spinach is good, and you should eat your green leafy vegetables, but they are not magical. And yet, even today, we have this persistent uh, myth that data uh, about spinach is got some super, super, super properties that they use uh, in order to do this. Data quality then is synonymous with information quality because, of course, poor data quality means you're going to have less accurate data. Uh, in order to pull all that up, which means we need a definition of data quality management. And again, this is the activities that allow us to take data and improve those pieces of it that we think are important to improve. Specific roles, deployment, responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera, all come together in this. It is a absolutely critical supporting process. It needs to come in conjunction with a change management discipline, and it should be a continuous process such that somebody is always there looking out for the quality. Now, the last definition on this page is for engineering, because if you're going to do things that run at hundreds of times, millions of times, tens of millions, I've got some companies that are working billions of times that they're running things. You need an engineering discipline. You cannot expect it to be one-off type solutions. And these engineering disciplines are absolutely critical in order to do this. And they're generally not well understood within IT or the business. So let's give a specific example here. This is improving data quality during a system migration exercise. The challenge was that this organization had 2 million NSNs, or SKU, stock keepers units. They were maintained in a catalog. Somehow during the process of this system, the data had been stored in comment fields. That comment field was a big problem because it means it's less structured than we'd like to have it. Long story short with all of this, we developed what would today be called uh, text analytics and help this organization by showing them how they could apply data quality methods in a semi-automated fashion. Another important aspect of this, too, is that this shows an example of diminishing returns. You should apply automation until you get less out of the thing you put into it, which means you need to measure both. One thing also, I won't get too far off track, but if somebody tells you that they can convert your unstructured data into structured data, hand them a glass of water or a lump of coal and say turn it into wine or, or coal, I don't care which, they can't do it and it can't be done. The definition of unstructured data is that data is unstructured and consequently cannot be structured. You can take semi-structured data and make it more structured and there's nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't sound as sexy as turning unstructured data into structured data. So the way we like to refer to it is converting your non-tabular data into tabular data. The reason I use this example in particular is because I saved the government more than $5 million and literally person centuries of work. Let's take a quick look at how we determine the diminishing returns. In order to determine whether you put more, get more out of it than you put into it, you have to hold one side of the equation fixed. In this case, the left-hand side of the equation is the weeks. Each week, I'm going to make up an absolute crazy number of $10,000 a week to employ two of my data engineers uh, full-time on this. I like to have teams on projects so they can work together. And these engineers did a great job on this. Believe me, it does not cost $10,000 a week to rent our data engineers. I'm using that for purpose of illustration only. And you'll also see it's important to understand expectations management around this. In this case, at the end of the first week, we told them it would probably take us a couple of weeks or a month to get some real results rolling. And it turned out at the end of the first week, we had achieved no matching items, ex extracting these items from this large pile of data that was non-tabular. We were able to go in with some careful work though, and by the end of the fourth week, we had solved 50% of the problem. That was actually pretty good. 
Uh, we'd also discovered that 11% of the data was rubbish and should not be moved, which meant our overall problem space had reduced to 30%. Now, the first reasonable question is, should we stop there with our data improvements? And the answer was, the customer said it would be worth continuing to try and get more. So they understood that every week cost them $10,000. And we got to week 14, 10 more weeks. So a total of 10 weeks, $100,000 of input into this particular process. And we were down to only 9% of the data had not been accepted now. Oh, sorry, hadn't been matched. The last couple weeks, the last five weeks, the customer said, okay, in this case, I'd like you to go after this one specific item, and that would be worth as much as another $100,000 to us. We put in five weeks, solved that problem, and were able to come up with the results for $50,000. Uh, as I mentioned before, the ignorable items stayed pretty same. We got up to 12% of week four, but by the time we finished the project, 22% of the data was rubbish did not deserve converting, which means that we had 70% of the items that were matched out there. And I don't know about you guys, but here's the original problem space of 2 million FKUs, and now only 150,000 of them needed to be processed by hand. So this was the calculus that went into this. Let's talk about specifically about the quantitative benefits. 2 million MSMs, let's just say five minutes to clean. Each one of them gives us a bunch number of minutes. Keep going down here at the number of people times the number of hours, 93 of them. There's my uh, person century, 93 person years required to do this at a cost of 500, excuse me, five and a half million dollars. Now, I'll move on to the next version, which is the lower numbers. And you can see here that these numbers were much, much uh, lower than the other ones. Again, replacing all of these all the way down to the total cost of seven years to clean the data at $420,000. Uh, and the most important number on this chart is the number five, because if you think you could solve this problem in five minutes, you're actually really, really deceiving yourself. So let's talk about some specific data quality misperceptions that you can fix all the data. You can't. That data quality is an IT problem. It isn't. IT is no, neither qualified nor cares what it is in there. It's just a sad fact that they're not, in fact, invested in it. Their attitude is if they can connect to the server, my job is done. Uh, the problem could be in data sources or data entry. It could be that the data warehouse will provide us a single version of the truth, that the new system will give us a single version of the truth, and that standardization will eliminate all of these problems. Well, these are, are nice misconceptions, but data quality problems are very much like the challenge of the blind men and the elephant. Uh, everybody knows that when you touch different parts of the elephant, you will end up thinking the elephant is different based on your exposure to it. And data quality turns out to be exactly that way. Most organizations approach the data quality problems by only seeing it from their immediate perspective. There's little cooperation across boundaries, and it leads to confusion, disputes, and very, very narrow thinking around that. The solution is that data quality engineering as a discipline can achieve a more complete picture and facilitate cross-boundary communication channels that we have. So we get into here and say data quality then is data that is fit for purpose. It's the only definition that makes sense. Let's take that from there and move on for a little bit further. Again, I did some writing in XML world, and I said, well, why haven't more organizations taken a more proactive approach to this? And the answer is quite simply that fixing the data quality problems is not easy, and once you start stirring things, you might make it worse. So it's a very good job. And since you brought it to our attention, you get to fix it now as well. All right, let's take a look a little further here. Again, many articles I see all over the place. Four ways to make your data sparkle. Hey, just prioritize the task, involve the data owners, keep future data clean, and align your staff with your business. Well, I don't know anybody that's followed four easy steps to actually make it work. Instead, I prefer to follow what I call a structured data quality engineering approach, which allows the form of the problem to guide the form of the solution, provides guidance decomposing the problem into some smaller bite-sized chunks, Again, how do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time. Features a variety of tools for simplifying the understanding, a strategy for evolving a design solution, providing criteria for evaluating it, and then, uh, of course, finally, facilitating the development framework. Our cycle that we use, this is the very same one that most of them work. It's called a Deming cycle. It's Plan, Do, Study, Act, or Plan, Do, Check, Act. And the idea is, of course, let's identify, define, identify, define as we go through. Here's the planning piece. What's the cost and impact? Is it worthwhile? Here's the deployment piece. Let's do some data profiling and see what's actually going on out there. Let's get some fact-based information because some of this is based on fact and some of it is not based on fact. I'll show you an example in a little bit. Uh, monitor what's actually happening. I made a change to improve things and then 
act to identify any specific issues that come out of that. You can read much more on Deming. It's no problem. It's, it's all very compatible. We absolutely embrace that particular view. The question is, of course, will all your data be perfect? No. You want to apply Pareto analysis, find that 20% of the data that covers 80% of your problems because not all data is of equal importance. In fact, 80% of your data is redundant, obsolete, and trivial, so why would you spend any time doing that, assuming you can actually identify which is the Pareto subset uh, in order to do this. Our cycle then is also related to the various data quality causes and dimensions. So there are two very distinct activities, and data quality activities depend on both. The first one are a set of practice activities. These are activities where somebody affects something that is happening in an operational context. I'll show you a very specific example of that. There are also structure activities, however, that require somebody to set something up right for success. Uh, again, if I were to put in an electric car and I don't have electric car recharging stations around uh, the place that I'm anticipating driving, that's a structure issue. It doesn't matter what I do from a practice perspective. If there are no charging stations, I have a different set of problems. And these are different. They both come together to produce quality data. Again, these practice-oriented activities stem from failure to rigorously apply different types of techniques. Uh, again, you might ask somebody to check things if they're on input uh, as opposed to waiting until they're processed uh, in order to do this. I'll give you a specific example. This is a company that I worked with uh, where they were doing uh, some interesting work and the, the director of the hospital actually asked me to come by and attend a meeting. And in this meeting, he announced to the hundreds of staff physicians uh, that were in the hospital, we we're going to do a bunch of knee surgery here. This is great uh, because knee surgery is, is what you guys do. I've ordered a bunch of equipment, gotten a grant. We're going to build a new wing on the hospital. It's going to be really exciting around here. And I, I looked out in the audience and saw a couple of people laughing. And so I waited till the, the individual was gone. And I looked behind and said, hey, what are you guys laughing about? And they all said, oh, well, the hospital director doesn't know that De, uh, knee surgery is the default hospital admission code. We aren't doing nearly the amount of uh, admitting hospital uh, 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 knee surgery that the individual thinks we are. Here's a case where the individual thought they were working with data and instead were working with incorrect data. And luckily, we were able to head that off and reverse it. Now, I mentioned the other part is structure-oriented activities. Again, this is where the data hasn't been arranged properly. And if the data is not arranged properly, it's going to be very difficult to make your systems work when you're looking at it from a strictly practice-oriented perspective. And the example I'm going to give you here is one from New York City. Uh, just quickly, New York City has 2.5 million trees. In an 11-month period between 09 and 10, four people were injured or killed by falling tree limbs in just Central Park alone. Uh, when you have trees and wind, it's kind of a bad piece. The arborists in New York City believe that pruning or maintaining the trees can help them make the trees healthier, more likely to withstand the storm and decreasing the property of damage, which would result in overall savings to New York City taxpayers. But they had no data to back it up. So they looked, and what they found was they actually had a, a problem of the data structured wrong. They were able to go back and look at pruning the trees, but the data on recording these pruned trees was recorded block by block. When you cleaned up the data, however, cleaned up the trees, it was addressed at the address level. And of course, trees don't come with unique identifiers, serial numbers, uh, tree IDs, you know, things like that. So it required them to download, cleanse, merge, analyze, and do all sorts of intensive modeling. But they did finally discover that causing trees to be pruned generally seemed to be reducing by a significant percentage the number of times the department had to send a crew in to do the emergency cleanup. Now, the best result of most of these analyses is another question. New York can't prune every block every year. So they have to look around and determine whether they could profile at the block level to do preventative maintenance of this. Again, I'm giving you the example down there. I've said the reference for the article before. But if the data is structured incorrectly, you can't get the information out of it, and that is a data quality problem. So these two dimensions, practice related and structure related, practice on top and structure on the bottom, are also composed, decomposed further into some characteristics. And I'm going to show you what those characteristics look like. Again, value, representation, model, and architecture. I know I'm running fast through these slides because I find that what most people tell me is that they take this and watch it again a second time. So I'll let you read those slides uh, when you come back to it. But let's take a look at how these things actually come about. Remember, 
architecture quality and model quality are related to structure issues, value quality and representation quality are related, in this case, to practice-oriented issues. Now, the idea here is that when we look across from left to right at the bottom of this chart, you'll see that the left-hand side of the chart is closer to the user and the right-hand side of the chart is closer to the architect, which means things that are closer to the user are more likely to be noticed, whereas the architect is probably unlikely to be incorporated into discussions on this. Here is the full set of data quality attributes. From a representation perspective, you can see they are listed. I'm not going to read them to you. Same, closer to the user, closer to the architect. But let's take another look at this. Moving from right to left, in this case, on your screen, one data architecture spawns multiple models. Each model spawns multiple potential values. Each potential value could be represented in multiple ways. So attacking things at the foundational level, at the structure level are much more effective in many cases than it is to try and work from the left-hand side into the right-hand side because there are so many more instances of going from left to right than there are going from right to left. We have to pay attention to this, and it's a little bit like being in the boat. If you look hard in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a little boat down there, and telling people that from that boat, I'd like you to impact Niagara Falls water quality. Well, we could wait until the falls heal over, but uh, in general, that's not going to happen, and we can't actually stop our business to do this. Not understanding these causes and dimensions leads organizations to look for overly simplistic solutions to the data quality problems. So let's look now at the data quality life cycle. Uh, again, our data quality life cycle here is a very nice piece, but it also represents generally the immaturity of the profession. And so I want to take a little bit of time to walk through this. Our original data quality lifecycle model said that data lifecycle consisted of two activities, acquiring data, storing it, and then using it. Now, this was a very reasonable piece. And notice the date on Tom Redmond's article here is 1993. Tom, of course, has evolved since then. If you haven't heard uh, my friend and colleague Tom speak, he's a wonderful author and has some terrific books out on the subject there that I would absolutely recommend you to. But this does represent that in 1993, this is what we thought was real. Let's take a look at what actually looks like. Turns out, if you're going to do a life cycle, you need to understand the difference between metadata and data. Metadata is data about data, and metadata is what is used to create the data structures that we then implement in our systems. I can't structure the metadata until I first created it, and this relates to data architecture and data modeling activities. Most people don't think of data architecture and modeling as data quality activities, but it turns out they are of absolutely key importance in this. Let me give you a very specific example on this. One of the ones that I use a lot is when I was with the U.S. military in the um, late 80s, early 90s, we had 37 systems that paid people in the Defense Department. The example that I like to tell in particular was that it was difficult because when the U.S. Department of Defense would ask a question of the various 37 systems, <clears throat> how, how many employees do you have? They would get back the question, what do you mean by an employee? Now, that sounds like an impertinent Question. It turns out not to be an impertinent question. It actually meant something because about 30% of the DOD workforce in those days worked a second job within the DOD. Working that second job within the DOD meant they were counted by the payroll system differently because there was no standard that existed. The lack of the standard, of course, was a major problem. So when people would say, um, how many do you have? And they'd say, well, it depends on what you mean by an employee no management was occurring because of this data quality problem. In fact, it, we could be even more precise with the data quality and data governance problem. Uh, we should have used standard definitions for persons as we developed all of the systems, but of course, it's always perfect to critique hindsight afterwards, whereas many of these systems were created by really wonderful professionals who were simply trying to pay the cow path that existed in their organizations before and did their best with what they understood the problem to be, which was not solving all of DOD's uh, payroll problems, but instead solving the data quality, excuse me, the uh, payroll problems for Randolph Air Force Base, just to pick one that we worked with over the years. So the architecture of this example here was very interesting. A person could be multiple employees is the best business rule to implement for this system. However, 
most payroll systems assume that you, as an employee, have exactly one job. Now, that structural indifference either causes us to undercount the total number of employees or to overcount them depending on how we create that. And a new system that we're bringing on to play to replace the old system should clearly have the ability to associate multiple, a person with multiple jobs. If I don't, I'm misundercounting or overcounting 30% of the force. And we found examples where many workplaces would count that as one individual, others would count that as one and a half, and so others would count it as two individuals. Well, if I'm trying to ask the question, how many people work for the Defense Department, and I've implemented three different sets of business rules for counting people, I have a structural problem, and no amount of data quality work at the practice level will fix that particular problem. We do consider it now a best practice as you are looking to purchase new software to look specifically at the incoming package. Is it considered best practice to ask for a logical model of the data that is processed by that system so that you can do things like we did at the Defense Department and check to see whether the new system would support the business practice of a person having multiple jobs native out of the box without any modification because if we modify it, we're going to have to remodify it when they add the next version to it and remodify it again. And if you've worked with plugins and Word and Excel and things like that, you know what the sort of a mess that can create for you as well. So long story short on this, metadata creation is part of the structuring activities, and this is absolutely important to understand in the life cycle of data. Only once I have metadata that has been created and structured should I then look to populate those structures by creating data within specific storage locations. It could be an S3 bin on Amazon, or it could be an old relational database that you're putting together. We, once we have created the data, store that data. Um, for those of you that are young, that thing in the middle there that looks like sort of a birthday cake with rings around it is, used to be our representation of a spinning platter, which is how we stored um, information on our spinning disks. Of course, the disks don't rotate anymore, and putting a flash drive out there, I might as well put an iPhone in it because they have huge, huge amounts of uh, data capacity. The data, once it's stored, however, can be utilized. Again, there's not much point in storing it if we're not going to utilize it. And once we've utilized it, we may manipulate that data, which means we may add more things to it. We may change different aspects of the data. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can happen uh, from that process. That's just general good processing of the data. And sometimes that data is stored back into the storage uh, facilities that we have. No problem there. However, in our utilization, sometimes we do formal assessments. Hopefully, most of the time, we look at least at reasonableness checks to say that the data values are coming up. And this is one of the things that, as I'm working with uh, the young people that are coming up through our various data science programs and things like that, that they will look at data and say, okay, so I've got the data, now what does it mean? Well, if you have a field labeled gender, one of the things that might be a really good idea to do is to say how many of the different genders do I have? Now, in the old days, we used to think gender was pretty straightforward. We had one or two if you were male or female. Nowadays, of course, we know the question is a little bit more nuanced than that. And while you may not have lots of them, Facebook actually defines for 63 different gender categories that we could have. Again, these are going to be their own types of problems. But let's just go back to our overall analysis. Are generally half the folks showing male characteristics and generally half the folks showing female characteristics? And is that the characteristic that your population should, in fact, have? If you're at an all-male boys school, you're probably not going to have too many females there. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're in a standard uh, public school classroom, you probably should have about 50-50 on it, although the ratio of females in this country is actually 52 to 48 uh, percent. Ladies, keep going. You will eventually uh, win us out by sheer numbers uh, in that sense. So. The assessment process is, what is the data looking like? Am I getting numbers that look good? If I don't have about 50% distribution, and I should, one might ask the question, why? Now, it turns out, one of the projects that we worked on that was a really fun project ended up being uh, tried under Canadian law because it was a, a Canadian company and they were subject to the Canadian Social Security Act. Canadian Social Security Act actually maintained uh, nine gender codes that they were supposed to keep track of. It would be against the law not to do them under Canadian law. And yet there had been a contractor who had done this and basically had written some data scripts that said, if M, then 
male in the target system, and if uh, elf f. And of course, elf f took everybody that was not male and put them in female, which again in today's environment would not be necessarily the best way to go about representing that information might in fact actually violate the law under certain circumstances. So this assessment process is something that occurs sometimes as part of data utilization, sometimes not. And that may still result in additional data manipulation if somebody might make corrections on it or refining the data where we actually do correct the value defects that occur in there. We're missing one other piece of this puzzle, as you can tell, and that is that we may discover, as we did in the Defense Department, that the metadata needs to be refined. And only when the metadata is refined can I restructure the model and then get back to where we need to be in terms of actually doing the data quality lifecycle. Now, this is a lot more complicated than the one I had on the previous page. And it is important to understand this because if I present the previous model, which showed acquisition, storage, and use, it's a nice simple story and it's easy to tell, but the reality is this is the space that we need to be working within. If we're not working in this space, it is going to be much more difficult for us to actually achieve the data quality results that we need to have. We may refine the architecture, change the model, all of these things are possibilities that we can work on in there. And it gets a little bit more complicated still if we want to add in uh, additional components. I, I'm not going to do that here in the interest of time. And somebody said, well, I don't care. You can't show me a cycle that looks like a square, so you have to turn it into a cycle here. So I did, and in this case, it's the same diagram, but notice the upper left-hand corner is the starting point for new system development, which happens occasionally still in the world. But most of the time, you start with an existing system. And you can see here that it has the same information in here showing that the data quality cycle runs counter to what most people think, counterclockwise and uh, actually has these following activities all involved in it. So I hope you see it's a little bit more complicated than most people attempt to make it. They'd like to tell you a simple story and make it easy to show this, but this is, of course, precisely why tools in general are not the place to look at when you're diagnosing and trying to attack your data quality engineering problems. So let's spend a little bit more time here talking about specific tool sets there are a wonderful set of tools. First one is what we call a set of data discovery tools, and data assessment can be done using two different approaches, uh, bottom-up and top-down. Bottom-up is that we're going to inspect and evaluate the data set. We're going to highlight potential issues based on the results of automated processes. Now, once again, I was very fortunate to be working for the Defense Department when they decided to attack data quality in a major way and put some research money behind it and funded some specific research into coming up with the answer to the question, how much of data quality can be automated? And it turns out the answer is quite a bit for certain types of problems. So this automation process I'll describe to you a little bit further on can be employed in this bottom-up assessment, which means we're looking at the data in the system and trying to figure out whether it is fit for purpose or how we can make it more fit for purpose. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Top-down, then, is that the business users are simply looking and saying that our data is of an insufficient quality and we need to put in place an organization-wide uh, initiative that allows people to see how they interact with the data and which data elements are then critical to supporting the basic business applications. Uh, another way to think of this is proactive versus reactive. The proactive approach says that, you know, we know our data is not very good and we're going to take an effort to uh, do something about it. Uh, one of the things I tell groups that I'm working with is that uh, probably nobody at the Social Security office has a lot of time to sit down and look at my Social Security data. Even though I'm approaching 60 years of age and getting closer to retirement age, uh, they just don't care. What they do instead is that they send me my own information. And if I look at my information and my information doesn't look right, Social Security is depending on me to wave my hands and say, hello, there may be an issue out there and could you guys look at it? One of the reasons that the government reaches out to us periodically to do this kind of assessment. So that's a proactive approach. It's not terribly proactive because Social Security doesn't have a lot of extra budget to sit down and actually reach out to us and have individual conversations uh, about what's going on in this. Now, let's talk about measures of data quality. And the idea here is that in order to properly measure 
the way data quality impacts things, it's important to select a specific outcome that was not ideal. Uh, again, I used an example yesterday of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that only lasted from about July to uh, November of that year, and then it fell into the Tacoma Narrows River. That's not a good outcome. Certainly, is a critical business impact. What would you evaluate? Well, you look at the specific dependent data elements that create and uh, what that create the uh, artifacts that are happening there. And they, they look specifically at the bridge falling and said, what went wrong when we built that bridge? What did we do that was incorrect? The answer was, in this case, they hadn't fully understood the impact of the wind and harmonic vibrations upon the structure. Uh, so that was interesting. Notice also that the best tool for this, something we call a CRUD matrix, which says that this business process has these inputs and these outputs, and therefore we can cut which data elements belong to which data processes uh, that are involved in it. Uh, you may want to associate specific requirements for the data that happen to be known at the time, certainly as you're understanding them, put down what you feel would be notional developments. Then specify the appropriate dimension of data quality that I went over earlier on this, and then say what business rules should we use to determine conformance. Uh, again, if the gender of the population sample size should be about 50% male, 50% female, then let's check and see what's happening there to make that not the case. Uh, one of the fun things we do with, with um, sample data sets around, for example, is that we'll, we'll hand them to groups and say, tell us about this, and they'll come back with a really interesting finding that all the customer names start with A. And then we say, well, did you think maybe you got a sample of a data set that was sorted alphabetically? Ah. So we're looking for measures, measurements of conformance and determining acceptable thresholds within that. As we evaluate these various service levels in here, we can then come back and say which elements are crucial to the business, which elements are less crucial right now but might be crucial later on, and determine what we call service level agreements, very similar to if you can pay a lot of money to make sure your air conditioning is running at every point in the summertime, and if it's not running, somebody will come out and fix it right away. Uh, that may be a premium service, whereas a, a next lower set may be that everybody's busy, but we'll get to you on the weekend after we fixed up all of our premium customers, so you'll have a couple of days that are hotter. Again, these are different ways of approaching the problem. By the way, service level agreements also determine which part of your organization or partner organization are responsible for the data quality uh, in there, and that's another very, very important aspect of this. Many organizations forget to put these in place or do not very good jobs of it, and when they do a not very good job of it, you end up with not very good results. Again, measuring and managing all of these processes, you're taking a look and trying to get to at least three levels of granularity. You may do this in stream where you're sampling things as they come by. Uh, you may get them in batch and do the totals of what happens from the top to the bottom. All of these are valid approaches depending on how you've defined the problem. The measurements then apply to three specific levels of granularity, the data set itself, the record level, or the data element value level, which would be an attribute within a particular instance or record. When we look at the overall qualities, uh, qual excuse me, data quality tool set that we have here, there are generally four categories of activities, analysis of the data, cleansing of the data, enhancement of the data, and monitoring uh, of the data. We'd like to have all four of these. The principal tools are profiling, parsing and standardization, transformation tools, identity resolution and matching, enhancement, and reporting. We're going to spend a little bit of time working through each of these. Profiling is a great place to start. I mentioned before uh, we funded some research at the Department of Defense and came up with some algorithms that are very similar in nature to the type of algorithms that you use when you're normalizing the data. If you are analyzing a data set, there's a way of looking at any set of data, applying these rules, and deriving what is a logical normal three, uh, third normal form set of data constructs that are around it. These algorithms do statistical analysis and assessment of the values that are within the data set, and also explore the relationships that would exist between the value collections on this. We're not going to spend a lot of time. I could do an entire one-hour seminar. If you're interested, send Henry some information on that, and we'll be glad to include that in here in our series of, of webinars. We just haven't found that people want to get down into the weeds that dirty to learn about this uh, in order to do this. But the quality is 
covered by these proscriptive rules that we have. And they now have um, service level agreements that require people to let you know when um, you've discovered types of things that are out there. So this is a proactive approach. It can also be applied in a reactive approach. But if you're doing perspective looking at it, remember your data is 80% rot, so if we get rid of the 80%, we have 20% left over, and if we do profiling to all that 20%, we'll have a really darn good understanding of what's happening in there. So we can notify the help desk that valid changes are about to cause an avalanche of skeptical user calls because all of a sudden everybody's had their um, Facebook password change just to cite an incident that happened in the, in the news recently, the last couple of weeks, uh, and other things like that. There are companies out there, one of the ones that we work with is a company called Global IDs that does the most extensive scanning you've ever seen in your life on this. This is for industrial strength organizations to come along and, and really see what's happening here. This is an organization like a big bank that we worked with recently that had literally 400,000 data sets out there that they didn't know what they did. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of different major databases and, and warehouses and things like that and this is industrial strength stuff that can be applied in, in much lower context, but when you're looking at something that the numbers are, as I just gave you, it gives you a lot of information. It goes through and does this classification that I described on the previous two slides, and then it adds a statistical analysis and says, oh, okay, we can also look at data that's over here, and it application for statistics is this data has the same set and ratio of values as the others, so they may be more related than originally thought. And finally, in Global IDs world, you can actually add a, a layer of semantics on top of this that helps out. All of these are tools to help you understand the values that you have in your data farm that's out there. Second set of tools, data parsing and standardization. Again, these are things that you would use uh, to go through and look specifically at them. If you want to take a look at a tool that does this kind of parsing and standardization, take a look at a tool called Trifacta. It's out of Stanford University. The data site is trifacta.org. Sorry, the website is trifacta.org. And you can look here and see that you can do very easy changes to dates and streets and standardize different things uh, around here. So that every time it finds an instance of something that is not perfect, it goes in and changes it to something that is more correct. We did an awful lot of this parsing and standardization in the example that I gave you with the 2 million SKUs a few uh, minutes ago on that. Number three, transformation. And this is ETL, uh, the easiest way to think of it. It's the idea that stuff comes from this organization in this fashion, but we need it somewhere else in a different fashion. And this transformation, extract, transform, and load is what you use to fill up data warehouses with things, to move data from place A to place B, to do all kinds of high-speed data transfers around this. <clears throat> Turns out there's an awful lot of good metadata and data quality rules that is buried in these pieces, and it's a really good place that most people forget to go look for business rules when they're trying to understand their data. Another key piece of this is being able to identify a unique instance. Now, that's what it means by identity resolution. We call it identify resolution. It's actually a better term for it. The idea here is that not that we're trying to identify people, but that when we can tie things together with these tools, so it dedupes the records, it clutches them into groups. There are two different approaches to this. There's a deterministic approach, which relies on, on rules and patterns. One of the rules, for example, in a, a data quality exercise, if you're trying to determine a person's identity, is what is the text they were born with, what is the birth date, and what is the zip code they were born in. And if it's close to the zip code that they're in now, the probability of that being the person that you think it is goes up by a fair amount because most people in the United States don't move more than one zip code away from where they were born. That's a really interesting rule and it means you can find things that way. The other aspect is probabilistic. So statistical techniques, uh, it's not reliant on the rules, but it can be refined so that we can provide more precise inputs as we do this. And issue here might be in terms of the probabilistic piece, tracking the two Russian guys that are accused of poisoning that uh, Russian spy and his daughter in the UK a couple of months back. Uh, they actually went through and came up with all kinds of photo resolutions once they decided who the targets were. 
they went through their photo databases of everybody that had a picture taken of them around the little town they were in in the UK. And they tried to apply this to matching things. They were able to pretty much put together that set of individuals' day. I can remember specifically one of the things they said was they came home to Russia because they had uh, they had not liked the snow that they had encountered, and yet all the pictures of them walking around in the UK town, there was no snow in those pictures. So these deterministic, deterministic and probabilistic ways of doing identity matching, not that identity is person, but that a thing, an event, could be something that you're trying to identify with here as well. Uh, again, very, very robust sets of tools on this. Enhancement to your existing data. Uh, many times you'll get a piece of data in and you'll be trying to do something else with it. And so you're trying to uh, combine it with other things. Uh, again, the U.S. national threat to security, the biggest U.S. national threat to security right now is the combination of data that you get when you combine the Ashley Madison data breach, the target data breach, and in this case, the OPM data breach. That, again, is another entire lecture that you get a sense for what needs to happen, and the bad guys are pretty good at this process. Finally, of course, just reporting, so showing this to people, and this is the Social Security office sending me out a report on a regular basis that says, here's what we think your retirement's going to look like for you as we move forward, uh, going forward. So these are six different ways that we can talk about data quality tools. The selection of that tool depends on which portion of the life cycle and which causes and dimensions of the data uh, problems that you're looking at in order to do this. So let's look at a couple of quick takeaways here and then we'll move to the question and answer session on this. The idea is generally that we want you to manage data as a core organizational asset. Yes, we still have to convince some people that that is in fact true, but we would like to do it as best we can. Identify gold records, the best source for all those data elements. And then, more importantly, when you find the good one, get rid of all the other stuff so that you don't have to have it, or at least mark it as redundant so that you know that you won't be fixing two piles of it. It's a great way to keep people doing the busy work, but it's absolutely unhelpful in the long run. Leverage your data governance groups for control and performance of data quality engineering. Use international standards wherever possible. Uh, try to make sure that downstream consumers actually understand what they're doing. If the data entry clerks at the hospital had understood that that data was being used to buy and train and build, uh, they probably would have been a little more careful about bringing people in and giving so many of them knee surgery diagnoses when that was simply not the case uh, in order to do this. Find out what the business rules are in order to conform to your quality expectations. Make sure that the business owners agree to and abide the data quality service level agreements that are in process. Make sure that you can correct your data as close to the source as possible. Lots of organizations like to say, we're going to capture the data once and we're only going to, right, it's like, well, good luck with that. I've, I've seen a lot of people make progress towards that, but it's not really uh, realistic to expect, certainly, that you're going to get it in the short term uh, in order to do this. And most importantly, report levels of data quality to the appropriate stewards, process owners, and service level agreement owners on all of this. So this is our summary of the overall process we've looked at over the last hour. And uh, hopefully you're a little bit smarter about the process of looking at data quality. It is not an easy task. It does require qualified personnel, and we'd like to help with that. That's one of the missions here we have at Dataversity. So I'm going to stop at this point, turn it back over to Tenley, and we will dive in for our questions and answers piece. By the way, I've included in all of this a series of uh, additional reference slides for you guys to use so that you can go a little bit deeper into these topics if you want. But now it's your turn. Let's see what questions you have. Okay, great, Peter. Um, looks like our first question is from Michael, and he's wondering, how would you approach rolling out data quality and data governance? Would it be simultaneously, sequentially, proportionately, um, like a 70-30% per split, or effort versus resources, and so on? So that's a great question, and unfortunately, the answer is it depends. But what I have seen work successfully in many organizations is that we're, many organizations aren't appreciative of data's quality as the sole non-depreciable, non-depletable, durable strategic asset that they have as organizations. And given that lack of understanding around that, it actually is a really good idea to look at a combined effort of saying, we're going to do data governance, 
And one of the things data governance will do is to increase the quality of our data. That way, it's very easy for people to see. I mean, can you imagine sitting down as an executive and going through all of the details that I just gave you there? They're not going to want to hear this. They want to know why they invested in the wrong thing. They pushed this button and that didn't happen the way it was supposed to. You know, there's all sorts of things and reasons that can go on. But when you tie governance to something very tangible in the organization, it becomes much easier for the organization to accept the very new um, occurrence of whatever it is we're doing, right, data governance in this case, and it's very clear to see that there's some results. So we might say, for example, um, we're working with a, a group right now that has two different catalogs that they're trying to reconcile. <clears throat> so customers will order from one catalog and order a product, and they'll order from another catalog, and they'll think they're getting a different product, but it actually is the same product because both catalogs show the same product with two different order numbers on it. So. In this case, the quality would be you're going to stop the number of confused orders that occur or reduce drastically the number of confused orders that occur in this case. And we're going to do that through a process that involves both governing the data and improving its data quality. I don't know specifically about your situation, Michael, but uh, if you have questions specifically, you know, feel free to reach out and we'll be glad to talk in more detail, but I hope that gives you a little bit of context it matters what your problem is, and then that will guide the form of your solution. And I think I said that some earlier in the hour. Thanks for the question. Great. Um, our next question is from David, and it's a two-part question. First, are there any preferred open source tools for measuring data quality? And then second, are there any preferred data quality methodologies? Good questions both. Let me see if I can do the first one. I may get you to come back and repeat the second one tenly if I get off track. Um, the, the, the first one really talks specifically about data quality methods, right? That was the first one? Uh, tools for measuring data quality. Uh, tools. Okay, sorry. Tools first. All right, great. I don't have the luxury of writing things down where I'm at here. So. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of tools that are out there, and in fact, you'll find probably more data quality tools than any other type of tools in the data space. That's both good and bad. Um, again, it, it leads managers to think that they can solve a data quality problem by buying a tool, and it's really a people, process, and technology solution that we need to have. So just a tool by itself will not help it. Uh, we have a saying that a fool with a tool is still a fool. Uh, I don't mean to say that people are, are ignorant about how to use them, but most of these data quality tools do address the breadth of quality problems that I showed during the presentation. So a very simple tool is a spreadsheet. Uh, again, I'll go back to Tom Redman. I, I, he does a couple of examples that I like and I use and, and hopefully attribute to him in a way that's, that's very favorable. One of Tom's favorite things to do is a Friday afternoon session where you go in and just say, let's just look at the data around our top 10 customers. So you go pull data around your customers for what you think are the top 10 customers. Now, usually this results in a little bit of confusion because some people say, well, how can you say that this company is not one of the top 10 customers? It's the boss's son. Of course, they should be a top 10 customer. And somebody else says, well, they may be a, the boss's son, and we want to treat them special because of the familial relationship, but golly, they don't do very much business. So how do we measure our best customers? Which leads to all sorts of questions and things like that that gets into another interesting aspect of data quality. How do we actually measure what is a good customer? For example, am I a good customer for MasterCard because I happen to use a MasterCard for a lot of my purchases? Uh, maybe I pay them 100 bucks a month for the charge card because it also gives me status for boarding, but I never pay them any interest. So does my 100 bucks a month cover the cost of that card, loading all that money that they give me during the weeks as I'm going and racking up my bills until I get to paying it all off at the end of the month? I don't know. So the spreadsheet can be a great place to start. You can just put data in the spreadsheet, take a look at it, see what's going on. Interesting. Very low tech, very approachable, guaranteed somebody in your organization somewhere has a copy of a spreadsheet that they can use to do this. So let's get to the other end, something like global IDs being a very uh, uh, comprehensive set of uh, products here. Again, I'm not making an ad for at global IDs. I've just got permission to use their slides, so it's easy to talk about. There's several of these uh, that fall into that family. 
but you know, do you really need to have something that comes in and scans and finds all your hidden databases? If you're a medium-sized company, probably not. If you're a big bank that's grown through acquisitions, yeah, that might be a, a good approach to take a look at. So standard tools, really not. We have some organizations that do well with data quality tools, and they will have a different conversation with you because they're going to ask you questions as to what your needs are and therefore try to match you with the right tool and the right need. Whereas a tool vendor with a more simplistic approach is just simply going to say, buy my tool and it will fix data quality problems. And the answer to that is probably true, but as you've seen, there are lots of different types of data quality problems. So the question is, will that tool fix this kind of problem if this kind of problem is the pervasive problem that I'm dealing with at the moment? Another approach to tools, too, is to look at the possibility of renting the tools. You may have a very vexing data structure problem that can be fixed, but you don't really need to buy the tool um, to have a perpetual license for forever and ever. You only need it for the time that you're using it. And there are ways of renting these data quality tools, mainly because the vendors are interested in income and they'd rather have you use the tool for a couple months than not use it at all. So they're looking at new ways of doing the licensing models and things like that. There's some companies like Informatica, again, a very fine company that has lots and lots of offerings in the data quality space. They certainly have a range and a variety of both profiling and other types of tools that we've used over the years very successfully in a number of projects. So the standard of the tool is really no. If you go to these vendor conventions, such as the one I'm at today, there's probably a dozen vendors doing data quality tools. And larger companies are going to be even hundreds uh, of them doing this kind of work. The question is, what do you need? And that's the role that your business people and your uh, data people can best determine and then select the appropriate tool for the appropriate task. Uh, so that was the tools piece on that. I hope I gave an answer. I hope it wasn't disappointing to you. It's a very big depends. But there's a lot of tools that you can, oh, I'm sorry, one more tool, too, to throw into here. In addition to spreadsheets, your next step up from there is going to be SQL Server. In fact, it turns out that when I'm teaching this uh, to various groups, somebody in the group will very quickly figure out that uh, just by running a program set of SQL queries against the database, you can largely accomplish many things that data profiling tools accomplish. So while that's interesting, it doesn't give you the retained corporate memory that these tools come up with, but you certainly get the immediate results in a very, very quick fashion uh, on this. So again, I would do, I would do you know, spreadsheets, uh, um, you know, SQL Server type activities, because you can do an awful lot with that. And then from there up into the more specialized categories. That's the tools piece. The methods piece is different. If you look at the word methodology, it actually means the study of methods. So I don't like the word methodology. But in terms of a standard way of approaching data quality diagnostics, uh, I've looked for it as well. And it turns out that not, there's no good book out there that's been written. It's really kind of disappointing. And I kind of going to myself, oh, well, I guess I'll have to incorporate some of that information into my next book because there does not seem to be a good source of information on that. Again, it's more like the thing I showed you earlier in the presentation where four steps to make your data sparkle. Just do these four things and all your data will be fine, right? Uh, it's kind of like telling people don't eat sugar and you'll never have any cavities. It's a nice thought, but if you understand the nature of ketchup and many other things in our society today, eliminating sugar from your diet is an extremely difficult thing to do. So uh, it's not as easy as just four little steps. Um, what I would say, though, from a methods perspective is to look at two aspects. One. Does it help you fix the data from a practice-oriented perspective? Because that's really what we're talking about here. To apply data quality to data structure challenges, that's going to require a different set of tools. So that's your first bifurcation point. These structure tools, you're probably only going to use one time right, to fix the problem of the data quality challenge in that area. You may use um, uh, your data uh, practice-oriented tools continuously. You may want to have something that's always watching all the traffic on the network to find out when things come in that say, hey, you know, up is down, and you really don't want to have up is down uh, in order to do that. I, I hope that answered your question. It's a, a bit of a difficult one, and the, the goal there is just be very wary of anybody that approaches you and says, buy one thing, and it'll fix all your data quality problems, because I hope that this presentation has showed you that's simply an impossible task. 
Okay, and our next question um, is more surrounded around the actual data. So do you have any suggestions for correcting data at the source when the source is not under your organization's control? The best mechanism for doing that is what we call the service level agreement, SLA. Your organization and another organization are exchanging data for a purpose. If they're exchanging data for a purpose and that purpose isn't specified, being the terms and conditions, the service level agreement, then you have the Wild West. I'll give you a very specific example of this. A magazine company that we worked with had a model that was based on uh, subscriptions. And it's an old model, as you can tell. Let's just pretend it was Rolling Stone magazine. It wasn't, but Rolling Stone magazine would make a nice example of this if it were actually them. And, and people subscribing to Rolling Stone magazine get bombarded with coupons and offers and Girl Scouts are giving it away and all sorts of things out there. Uh, this magazine decided to outsource its subscription acquisition process. It's an important part of the business. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the fuel that essentially made this magazine run. By outsourcing it to another organization, they were a relatively immature organization and didn't really have a good service level agreement in place. So the agreement was that they would send them X number of hundred subscriptions per month. They didn't actually have anything in there that specified that these subscriptions had to be valid subscription. And I know that sounds crazy, but yes. Uh, so they were sending lots and lots of rubbish over the line, and the magazine company was having a problem with its subscription base falling and falling and falling. And we asked to see the service level agreements, and that's, of course, when we found out they didn't have one. We said, oh, well, we can correct this pretty easily. Let's put in place a service level agreement that says that you can only send us subscriptions that are people that have been verified in well, let's say we're going to bounce it off of uh, Equifax or, or TransUnion or something like that to make sure they're real people. I'm not suggesting, by the way, this is a good way of doing this. I'm simply saying that by verifying these accounts, we would have a much better quality of input that comes in because it turned out when we measured, they were actually sending over two records that were not useful for every record that was useful. And I don't know about you guys, but if I'm paying for something and I'm only getting 30% of what I pay for, I'm going to go back and renegotiate that with the vendor. Again, great question. Thank you for it. Okay, and in your experience, where do most organizations go wrong in terms of data quality? Just by not understanding it fully. <laughs> I'm working with several organizations now that have said they're going to become data-centric organizations, and we're going to have 100% of our data all clean, and we're going to do this by buying this one tool. Yeah. Oversimplification of both the process and the results, the process and the approach and the results, and, and expecting things to actually get better. Uh, as, as you've seen from this presentation, data quality has a lot of nuances. For example, one of the uh, uh, my favorite examples of data quality is that I bought a microwave oven from General Electric. And being a male, uh, I uh, broke the tray on it right away, the glass tray that spins, because of course if you're going to buy a microwave oven and you're reheating stuff, as most of us males do, <laughs> yeah, you want that thing to spin, because heating it up without a spinner makes it heat less evenly. Consequently, when I broke the tray, I went, I better fix that or my spouse will be upset with me. So I went to look at it online and found that the cost of the replacement tray was actually more than the cost of buying a new oven entirely. Very frustrating exercise. Actually, I went to the Goodwill store and they were able to find me exactly the model that I needed to replace it with. Is that a data quality problem? Well, perhaps. It's unlikely that the part for that tray is actually worth more than the oven was. But on the other hand, could that be a surreptitious attempt by General Electric uh, appliances division to try and force me to buy more ovens because they get um, their stock price is more influenced by more number of ovens that they sell than it is the number of parts of ovens that they sell. So there's all sorts of nefarious um, aspects that get into this. The idea is 
what is your organization doing and what are you trying to do? You have to have good goals and objectives in order to come up with this. Otherwise, you can end up spending way, way too much time and effort on things that are not really productive for the organization. I'm not sure I wandered on that one, Tenley. Did I, you think I did a good job answering that one? Um, I think it came across pretty well. Um. <laughs> our, our audience is, is great with their feedback, so if I didn't do it right, please ping me and we'll try to do better on that. Oh, yes. We, we definitely welcome the, any clarification <laughs> around that. Um, so let's move on to our next one in which we have um, a chat that came in from Alford asking, how do you select proper dimensions in data quality within banking, as, you, as in using too many scorecards may or may not dilute the purpose? <laughs> hey, great. Uh, and it's not just scorecards, but we're seeing dashboards as well. Oh, we want some data quality dashboards. Well, if you're looking at a nice pretty display and it's all green, do you really need a thousand green buttons on it? Or can you, in fact, make it a more simplified approach and say, you know, things are trending? So it's the difference between precision and aggregation that you're looking at here. <clears throat> Banking in particular is going to have interesting numbers. One of my favorite data quality exercises I did with a group was a Midwest credit union where, believe it or not, two vice presidents would sit down and argue about whether sales were up or down in front of the um, executive. Now, if you've got two of your lieutenants and one says sales are up and the other says sales are down, one thing you know as an executive is they can't both be correct. So to try and correct this Problem, we needed more clarification around the definition of a sale, the various responsibilities, products, impact on product mix, et cetera, et cetera. And in the banking industry, and we've worked with six of the ten largest banks in the world, there are very specific measures that in at least domestic U.S., <coughs> the government wants you to do very precise things around that. And Conforming to those places is a really good place to start because if you're not compliant with the government activities, yeah, your stockholders are going to be less impressed. Uh, again, sometimes it's the case of just trying to stay out of the papers, but more often it's the case that many organizations don't really understand the proper approach to quality is to make it an integrated part of everybody's job, to not just have one group responsible for it so that it's implying that everybody else can be lax in their approach to quality. While we see dashboards as useful, it's kind of like people thinking that they're going to solve their analytical problems by going out and buying really fine products like Tableau and QuickView or Amazon uh, QuickSight, you know, various different pieces like that. All of these are fine, but you need more than just the tool. You need to have the people and the processes in place in order to make this stuff work all the way around. In the banking industry, there are some specific user groups. Uh, we're associated with one called FIBO. Uh, it's a, a terrific organization that talks about the maturity of banking practices and has some specific work around that. If you have trouble locating them on the web for some reason Google's not working for you, give me a shout and I'll point you in the right direction. Uh, they do participate in the Enterprise Data World Conference, which is uh, the one we're headed up to in Boston in the spring, mid-March. So that would be a good place to go learn more about these. Again, I hope that helps. Great, and it looks like our last question for today um, comes in from Mike, and it just states, it seems today there are too, too many quick fixes and approaches to taking data sources and using them in analytics without first understanding the rules about the data or the metadata. Um, can you weigh in on what your, you know, feelings are around that? My experience is 100% agreement. Uh, we see an awful lot of people and again, the example I gave you with the uh, um, knee surgery is a, a perfect example of that. Garbage in, garbage out. Where we had an executive who was making very good data-driven decisions without realizing that the quality of his data was unknown. And of course, what we'd like to do is make sure that the data of his, the quality of his data is known. Not that it's perfect, but that it's known. For example, if you had told the executive that the admission data tended to come in uh, and it was generally about 30% accurate, that individual would have made much less of a commitment to knee surgery and would have instead gone in and said, okay, let's find out more about the data. It is not critical that you know all of your data is perfect. 
What is more important, however, is to find out your critical data elements and what level of quality they currently have. Because if we don't have a good idea of what the data quality is, it is unknown. Now, again, I can't tell you how many organizations I've walked into where I ask the question, can you tell me that the quality of all the data in this organization is unknown? Of course, the reason you wouldn't want to hear that is because it would be a lot of companies that I've worked with, and you wouldn't want to hear that they don't know about the quality of their data. Let's just pretend I was working with an airline. And the airline said, yeah, all of our data is of unknown quality. By the way, I've never worked with an airline that said all of their data is of unknown quality. But you would really question about whether you should be getting on that airplane or not uh, when, you, when you hear that kind of a situation. So yes, there's an extreme over-reliance on the technology component of this, and that's a great place for everybody to stop today, is to say, no, let's not do tool-specific a focus. It's going to take a balanced approach of people, process, and technologies, and that those should be implemented in a way that makes sense for the organization to make the data fit for purpose so that your organization can then move on with what it's really trying to do, which is the business. Oops. Where's our next thing? There we go. There's our next thing. <laughs> so our next webinar we've got is November. We're going to do data architecture versus data modeling. Tell me, I look forward to joining you on November 12th. Oh, that would be lovely. I can't wait. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so right now it looks like we're, we're uh, through our question portion, and we'll be giving a few minutes back to everyone's day. And just a reminder that we will be posting the webinar recording and the slides to dataversity.net within two business days, as well as sending out a follow-up email to let you know the links and other requested information throughout the webinar. So thank you again, Peter, for a great pre presentation, and thank you all for attending today's webinar. I hope you have a great day. Very good. Thank you so much, Tenley. Talk to thank everybody you. soon. Take care. Bye-bye.